All right, well, tonight is the last lecture for the philosophy class, and we're going to do a bit of review at the end, so I won't go over like I usually do at the beginning, kind of laying out the, the theme of the semester. I've done that plenty of time for you guys. But I do want to start by summarizing last week a little bit. If you remember last week, I mentioned that the term postmodernism can be used in two different ways. And this is normal in language, right? Like the word bark can be used in a lot of different ways depending on the context and what somebody's trying to communicate. Well, also, the, it's true with postmodernism. And there's at least two major ways that the term is used. One way is the way that I've mostly been using it in this class, and that is as a broad term to refer to really 200 years worth of philosophical movements in the 1800s and the 1900s. All of the movements during those two centuries, and I guess now the third century, we're in the, what, 21st century? Um, movements that have been reacting, uh, sometimes overreacting, to modernism. So I've been using the term mostly in this class in a very broad sense to refer to those 200 years. But you've got to be careful because sometimes when people use that term, and the way that I was using it last week, was to refer to a very specific philosophical movement that arose out of structuralism. So if you can, if you can kind of remember the trajectory of thinking, there was the big movement after World War II, existentialism, and structuralism came along after that and kind of critiqued some things. That's how usual, usually philosophical movements will begin by critiquing the previous one, right? And then structuralism, there were thinkers within structuralism that started critiquing that, and they became known as the post-structuralists. And these are just terms that somebody used and it stuck, whether you like it or not. Eventually, these post-structuralists uh, were called postmodernists. So these, especially these big three, uh, Derrida, Foucault, and Rorty, are referred to as the postmodern philosophers in that particular postmodern movement that began roughly in the 1970s. So you just have to, when somebody uses the term, you have to think from the context or ask them if you can, are, the, are you talking about this, you know, all the movements in the 1800s and 1900s that were reacting against modernism, or are you specifically talking about this very specific movement that began in the 70s, led by these three guys? So we talked about this specific movement. We looked at some of their thoughts and they had picked up a lot of things from previous movements, including existentialism, even though they, they critiqued aspects of existentialism. They picked up ideas from existentialists. Um, we saw in particular that Foucault was a follower of a lot of Nietzsche's ideas. So a lot of these things compound and grow and change, but they're all still part of this movement of finding meaning more on the inside, more of subjective, relative truth. Now, this specific movement of postmodernism in the 70s and 80s was very influential with the youth. And you can imagine why. You know, youth, including myself when I was young, um, had a lot of anger and resentment towards authority. And this sort of postmodernism fueled that uh, resentment, fueled that anger, and kind of legitimized it in a sense. And so it caught on very popular with young people. But interestingly enough, it didn't win very many academic philosophers to their side. So if you look at, you know, even in the 70s and 80s, all the people who are professional philosophers, who have a terminal degree in philosophy or teach philosophy um, as a professor. Not many of them were won over to this specific postmodern movement. In fact, 
the extremes of this movement in the 70s and 80s, it, it's almost as though it woke up a lot of academic philosophers to the silliness of this subjective idea, this, this idea that truth is found inside. So there's a sense in which, you know, if I can go back to using the term postmodern in a broad sense, all of these movements of finding truth inside of ourselves in the 1800s and 1900s, when it got to an extreme version of that in the 70s and 80s, it kind of helped a lot of philosophers realize the mistakes and the absurdities that such a position leads to. And so there was actually a strong, and there has been ever since, a very strong reaction among academic philosophers against this postmodern movement. There's been a lot written about it, uh, written against it, in fact. So Derrida, Foucault, and Rorty found themselves with a lot of opponents very quickly and have ever since. And that's what I want to focus on tonight, at least in the beginning of our lecture tonight, are these critics of postmodernism. You know, who has stepped up to the plate and criticized Rorty and Foucault and Derrida? And there's partly, there's in a sense, I'm going to be asking and trying to answer the question, where is philosophy going to go from here? So there's a sense, and if, if you read a lot of uh, books on the history of philosophy, they'll usually end with this movement. Uh, Rorty, Derrida, Foucault in the 80s and 90s even, in a sense. I think some of them are still living. I can't remember. You'd have to check that. But it kind of brings you all the way up to today, in a sense, at least in terms of most books on the history of philosophy usually end right here. But the question I think we can ask is, okay, well, where... Where is Western thinking going to go from this point? So that's also one of the big questions I'm going to be discussing tonight, is where are things going? It's very hard to say, right? And I'm not, I'm not going to make any claims that I know where philosophy is going. I know where I hope philosophy is going. I can tell you, as you know from my position, I've been wearing it on my sleeve in this class, so you probably would guess what I hope happens in philosophy and Western thinking. But besides just me hoping that, I do think that there are some signs that pre-modern thinking is making a comeback. It, it might not never become the majority again, like it was, you know, before modernism. However, and just in terms of percentages and philosophers out there, the percentage of pre-modern thinkers have def has definitely grown over the last 30 or 40 years. So how big does that percentage have to be before you call it a, a comeback or a resurgence or a renaissance? I don't know. But I want to tell you about some of these contemporary pre-modern thinkers and show you the influence that they've had in the academy. And as I believe we're seeing, having an influence in culture. And so that's some of the things we want to look at tonight. So of all the critics of postmodernism, some of the critics are proposing that we go back to more of a pre-modern position or a pre-modern way of, of thinking. They argue that the problems of postmodernism come from a wrong turn that philosophy took in the early modern era. And this is very similar, of course, to what I've been saying in this class. That stage three, the early modern era, is where things took a wrong turn. In stage one and two, faith and reason were working together, but beginning in stage three, the beginning of modernism, we went down this path, which I've called prideful reason, where we tried to figure things out using our reason alone. And some of these pre-modern thinkers that we're going to look at tonight would affirm that. They're, they say the same thing that I do, 
that modernism and the Enlightenment had serious errors. Some good came from those movements, of course, but they had serious errors within them. And it was overreacting to the errors of modernism which led to postmodernism. The way I've been describing this class is then, you know, when modernism hit those dead ends, they tried this other path, this irrational faith path, faith by itself, which is just a colorful way of talking about how we're going to trust what's inside. That's where truth really is. We're just going to believe it, the irrational things, desire, passions, feelings, emotions. That's the irrational aspect of our personhood, of our thinking. And that's what becomes king in this path, in this movement, which was an overreaction to that path. And so what I've been proposing and what these other pre-modern, contemporary pre-modern thinkers are proposing is to go back to stage one and stage two before we took these wrong turns. Okay, we've talked a little bit about this. You might remember uh, a few weeks ago, I told you about analytic philosophy. You might remember that lecture. And I explained how within analytic philosophy, there's been a resurgence of pre-modernism. A resurgence of Christianity, yes, but also a resurgence of pre-modernism. Because don't, don't necessarily associate pre-modernism with Christianity. Christianity is definitely pre-modern, but there are other belief systems that are pre-modern as well, including like Aristotle and Plato. They would be pre-modern as well. So in this pre-modern resurgence within analytic philosophy, there are a lot of Christians, but there are also some uh, non-Christians who think in a pre-modern way, and we're, we're, we'll look at some of those tonight. If you remember, though, <clears throat> when we talked about analytic philosophy, analytic philosophy actually started as an extreme version of modernism. So early 1900s, I believe, stage um, uh, five, we had analytic philosophy begin, and if you remember at the beginning of analytic philosophy, they were trying to make philosophy more like science. In fact, they said science really is the only thing that can determine truth, whether something is true or false, and we as analytic philosophers are just there to help science along. We can help define words and make sure things um, our sentences are meaningful, not meaning as in like purpose of the universe, but meaningful in terms of science, you know, what's the analytic philosopher said what was meaningless were things like moral statements, statements about religion, because those couldn't be proven empirically, so they were meaningless statements. So the beginning of analytic philosophy started out as an extreme form of modernism rejecting things as meaningless if they couldn't be proven scientifically, which includes, as I said, moral beliefs, religious beliefs, metaphysical beliefs. But if you remember in that lecture, I explained how, even though that's how analytic philosophy began, starting in the 1970s, the extreme version of analytic philosophy, which is called logical positivism, That'll come up again tonight. You might remember that term. Sometimes it's referred to as logical empiricism. So you can know just from that term what it's talking about. But the extreme form of analytic philosophy mostly died out, logical positivism. And then there was this resurgence of pre-modern thinking within analytic philosophy. Keep in mind that big divide between analytic philosophy which is more over here in stage five, and continental philosophy. Even nowadays, that's the big divide in philosophy. So if you're an academic philosopher, the big thing that's going to distinguish you first and foremost probably is, are you analytic or continental? 
And most people, you know, during the 20th century who wanted to be religious or to believe in religious things gravitated towards this side, the irrational side of things, continental philosophy, because analytic philosophy was just very hostile towards anything religious. I mean, logical positivism said any religious statement is meaningless. It can't get much more hostile than that. So most religious people gravitated, unfortunately, to continental philosophy, but that caused them to buy into this whole way of thinking that truth is internal, truth comes from within. And there's a lot of problems in theology. If you want to research, go down this path, you can study. Oh, what I would encourage you to do is look at Van Til, Cornelius Van Til and Francis Schaeffer's critique of Karl Barth and their critique of neo-orthodoxy in the 60s and 70s, and then you'll understand how you know, trying to do Christianity in this continental side of things can cause a whole host of not only philosophical problems, but theological problems. But anyway, what happened then within analytic philosophy is now there's been this resurgence of not only religious thinkers, Christians, but pre-modernism within analytic philosophy. And as I mentioned in this lecture a couple weeks ago, these new pre-modern analytic philosophers are analytic in the sense that they use the analytical style of philosophy. And what do I mean by that? Well, the analytical style is to make very precise logical arguments. So they do a lot of technical work. That's why it's difficult for a lot of people, if you're not into technical philosophy, to read or really benefit from because it can be rather technical. But logic, uh, reason is huge. That's the style of analytic philosophy. And these, they're analytic in the sense that they recognize the importance of reason. They argue, like I do often, that our faith should be based on good reasons and evidence. And so this pre-modern way of thinking has made a comeback within analytic philosophy. Even though analytic philosophy began very anti-religious, very anti-pre-modern, it was an extreme form of modernism, we're going to kind of see tonight how this resurgence of pre-modernism happened within this movement. As I mentioned, uh, these pre-modern, a lot of these contemporary pre-modern thinkers in analytic philosophy are Christians, including myself. So as I've been saying tonight, um, within the umbrella of this resurgence of pre-modern thinking, there's a resurgence within that umbrella of Christianity within academic philosophy. And to prove my point, or to give evidence for that, I want to share with you an article from Time Magazine. Now, I had Caleb send out uh, several handouts for you tonight, and you're going to need to have them handy. You're going to need to be able to reference them or look at them while we're covering these handouts. So grab them somehow, whether you've printed them or you have them electronically somehow. You're going to need them right now so you can follow along, not only for this handout, but for the other ones later. Okay, this comes from, this handout comes from that uh, article from Time Magazine. Now, I'm sure you're aware Time Magazine is not a Christian magazine, obviously. But this article they published... Um, noting that God, or Christianity in particular, is making a comeback within academic philosophy. So this isn't just me saying this, this is Time Magazine uh, taking note of this. And this isn't the entire article, this is just several in, uh, excerpts from the article that I wanted to draw your attention to. So I'm going to read these. This is straight from the Time Magazine article, and you can follow along. Here's how it starts out, God, question mark. Wasn't God chased out of heaven by Marx, banished to the unconscious by Freud, and announced by Nietzsche to be deceased? 
Didn't Darwin drive God out of the empirical world? Well, not entirely. In a quiet revolution in thought and argument that hardly anyone could have foreseen only two decades ago, God is making a comeback. Most intriguingly, this is happening not among theologians or ordinary believers, most of whom never accepted for a moment that he was in any serious trouble, but in the crisp intellectual circles of academic philosophers, where the consensus had long banished the Almighty from fruitful discussion. Now it's more respectable among philosophers than it's been for a generation to talk about the possibility of God's existence. The shift is most striking, most striking in the Anglo-American academies of thought, where this, this is analytic. Remember I said analytic philosophy is mostly British, Anglo, and American, and continental philosophy is mostly on the continent of Europe, German, French, not exclusively, but generally. So they're noting this is happening within analytic philosophy. So the shift is, the shift is most striking, striking in the Anglo-American academies of thought where strict forms of empiricism have reigned. Uh, and he quotes some of the beginning, some of the early analytic philosophers and their extreme modern views. What science cannot tell us, mankind cannot know, declared Bertrand Russell. And A.J. Eyre, on behalf of, there you go, logical positivism, decreed that all utterances about the nature of God are nonsensical or meaningless. The accepted wisdom was that the only valid statements were those verifiable through the senses. All right, if you go down to the uh, fourth paragraph down, well, I guess it's technically it's the third paragraph after the title of the article, it starts off, uh, today, even atheistic philosophers, this is the Time Magazine article, today even atheistic philosophers agree that Ayer's rigid rule is inadequate to deal with human experience. So a lot of, as I said, logical positivism has pretty much died out in philosophy. Meanwhile, science, his model for learning, has become less presumptuous and ambitious. It's theorizing about cosmic astronomy closer to theology. Its promise as savior and absolute explainer of the world somewhat tarnished. He's talking about the fa failure of modernism and how a lot of philosophers are saying that uh, through science, a lot of evidence for um, theology is coming about. Uh, evidence for the existence of God through astro um, astronomy and other sciences. Broad cultural forces are also at work says Douglas Hall, a theologian at Montreal's McGill University, quoting him, the experiment with secularism finally proved to be too much for the human psyche to cope with, both in the Marxist world and in our world, if you begin to doubt that there is some meaning in the process of history, then you get frightened of your own secularity and you return to religion. I'm not going to comment on the psychological aspects of this, cultural aspects, he calls them. In the U.S., 300 of them, uh, Christian philosophers that is, belong to the Society for Christian Philosophy. Uh, the Society of Christian Philosophers, I'm a part of that society. And this, this was written, I think, in the 90s. So, I mean, this, is, this article is over 20, 25 years old. Um, and things have grown from there. I mean, there are thousands of, of people that are part of the Society of Christian Philosophy now. I, um, I've gone to some of their meetings. I presented a paper at one of their meetings in, in L.A., a few years ago. Some of these scholars are attacking atheism and reviving and refining arguments for theism that have been largely unfashionable since the Enlightenment. I would say even before the Enlightenment. Using modern techniques, here you go, modern techniques of analytic philosophy and symbolic logic that were once used to discredit belief. That's why they're still called analytic philosophers, because they're using their techniques and their style of arguments. Even non-believers, Kung writes, know that an unjust world raises the question of morality and, in turn, religion. Besides that, the 20th century is littered with the sorry results of supplanting God with an absolute force that is not divine, such as the people, the group, the, the nation in Nazism, or the party in communism. 
So we'll get into that a little bit tonight, but um, you know what happened, in, and especially in a lot of group oriented political theories like fascism and communism, uh, fas fascism, uh, Nazism was just one type of fascism, fascism that uh, put the group before the individual and the group that they put first before the individual was the nation or the ethnic race. Whereas communism is the same thing, they put the group before the individual, but the group is a different group than the nation or the race. In communism, the group is the uh, working class or the oppressed class sometimes. So both fascism and um, communism are group-oriented political theories. And what happens oftentimes is um, when, when there's no God as the... Um, supreme authority, if you will, at least in our thought life, if there's no God there, the state, the government rushes in and fills that power vacuum. And a lot of have, have argued that's what he's picking up on here. A lot, of, a lot of people have argued that that's what happened and how Nazism, fascism, and communism became popular is when God was taken out of people's thought life, God was dead, according to Nietzsche, then the state or the group if you will, in these group-oriented political theories filled in that power um, vacuum. Well, can God's existence be established by reason without resorting to the Bible, revelations, church dogmas, or a leap of faith? The attempt at doing this was traditionally known as natural theology. And except for the largely self-contained world of Roman Catholic philosophy, it went out of style more than a century ago, which is what I've been saying. Apologetics and Christian philosophy kind of died out. And it's because of the, the shift, the movement to the, you know, truth is inside. Because if truth is inside, you don't need reason. It was an anti-reason movement for over 100 years. But that's, that's changing, as I see it, and Time Magazine sees it. So in the current revival, most arguments still employ the traditional definition of God as a unique personal creative entity. Not necessarily all of them are Christians, a lot of them are, but usually it begins with, you know, is there a God, is there a supreme being or not? What's new is the effort to refurbish and enhance the traditional approaches to the problem. So now the article uh, goes on to talk about one of the biggest names in this movement, and of course that's Alvin Plantinga. So America's, this is the Time Magazine article, America's leading Orthodox Protestant philosopher of God, Alvin Plantinga, this time he was at Calvin College, develops a related argument from one of the pressing issues in modern epistemology. Though it sounds strange to the man in the street, philosophers ponder how an individual can know that there are are any creatures beside himself who thinks, feels, and reasons, or how he can know that anything ever existed in the past? How, for instance, can we know if another person is really in pain or not? We can't, you know, go into their minds and experience their feelings. Plantinga answers that such knowledge is acquired through analogy, and in his book, God and Other Minds, he makes an intricate analytic philosophy intricate case that this is the way that believers, one way believers can know God, that God exists. Since it's perfectly plausible to infer that other minds exist, human minds, he thinks it's reasonable to believe that God does as well, an ultimate mind. Oxford's uh, J.L. Mackey, perhaps the ablest of today's atheistic philosophers, offers non-supernatural explanations for such evidence and raises the problem as old as the book of Job of evil. The existence of evil is no knockdown disproof of an omnipotent and holy good God, he says, but it does make God improbable. This atheist is saying that. Planica, uh, Planica re renovates the theist's classic reply to this, the free will argument, examining whether a semi-fictional corrupt Boston mayor would have taken smaller bribes in, another pos in other possible worlds 
He argues that even an all-powerful God can't create a world in which mayors can choose to take bribes and that also contains no evil. It's just talking now about more of Plantinga's work that he did against the problem of evil, which we'll study next semester in uh, the apologetics class I'm teaching. So anyway, I just use that to show people that it's not just me claiming that pre-modernism and Christianity is making a comeback. Time Magazine, it's a big enough comeback that Time Magazine has taken note of it, and not only Time Magazine, just using that as an example. So, I want to look at some more of these contemporary pre-modern thinkers with you. So utilize this handout. This is the longest handout for tonight. And it's just 10 of these contemporary pre-modern thinkers. We've talked about the Time Magazine article, talked about Alvin Plantinga, and he's included in this list of 10. But I also want to tell you about nine other ones. So a total of 10 contemporary pre-modern thinkers. So instead of just talking about them, you know, in general, I want to give you some specific names and some specific people, where they're teaching, what they're teaching, so on and so forth, so that you're familiar with them. And now you have this handout, and you can do further research about them or in their work. So we're going to spend most of the rest of the night just running through these 10. And these aren't the top 10. These might not even be the most important 10. These are just the, some of the 10 or some of the contemporary pre-modern philosophers that I'm fairly familiar with because of my work in philosophy. But some of them, I think, are some of the top names as well. Some of them we've already talked about in the lecture I gave on analytic philosophy. When I talked about the resurgence of pre-modernism within analytic philosophy, we talked about a few of these. And so we're going to see a couple of them that we've, we've looked at already. We'll go through them pretty quickly. So one of these is Alasdair McIntyre. You can see all the places on the screen where he has been a professor. Seems like he's been a professor at about everywhere. Oxford, Notre Dame, Duke, Boston, Yale, Princeton. He was uh, president of the American Philosophical Association, which is the biggest um, philosophical academic society in America. It, I mean, it is the one. He converted to Christianity in the early 80s when he was around 50. And listen to this. He describes his work, his philosophical work, as an Augustinian Thomist approach to moral philosophy. So the two big names that we talked about in pre-modern thinking, Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, he describes his work as their approach, basically. His most famous book, After Virtue, I think came out in the 80s. One of the most important works most people recognize, one of the most important works of moral philosophy in the entire century. So huge. And he does a history of philosophy, at least moral philosophy, which, was, which is really useful. I summarized it in, in a book that I have written, which will hopefully come out soon. But just summarize uh, uh, his quick a run through of history. It's going to sound very familiar to what I've been saying all semester, but he basically says the Enlightenment project has failed, and now we have two. We have uh, two choices before us. We can either settle our moral questions via Nietzsche's will to power. Basically, might is right. Or we can go back to the rationality rooted in the virtue of the ancients and the medieval thinkers. Back to pre-modernism. So basically, I mean, if you think about it, he's, he's, putting the, he's putting out there in this one sentence, he's putting out there the three movements, pre-modernism, modernism, and post-modernism. And he's saying modernism has failed, and now what we're left with is Nietzsche's post-modernism or going back to pre-modernism. And of course, he advocates for going back to pre-modernism. The next one I want to point out to you is Richard Swinburne. Uh, one of his books, Reason and Faith, you can tell just from the title what he's getting at. He's a very well-renowned, famous analytic philosopher at Oxford University. 
He describes himself as drawing from Aquinas a systematic approach to philosophical theology. Now, I explained this to you guys before, but this is kind of my lineage. My academic lineage um, is traced back to Swinburne. So Greg Welty got his PhD at Oxford under Swin Swinburne, and then I got my PhD under Welty. So that's where my training and education has mostly come from, is this movement, and Swinburne and Welty in particular. John Hare is the next one. Uh, John Hare degrees from Oxford, Princeton. Right now he teaches at Yale. A quote from him. No one looking at the discipline, he's talking specifically about moral philosophy here. No one looking at the discipline in the, in the late 60s when I was doing my training would have predicted the existence of this series. Talking about all these books that are advocating for a theistic understanding of morality. These titles and others like them are a manifestation within ethical theory of a much larger shift within the discipline. And what he's talking about is this pre-modern resurgence. Theistic resurgence in particular is what he was talking about. The next one is uh, two, two um, Roberts. Robert Adams, very well known, both him and his wife, uh, both academic philosophers. She's passed away, Marilyn Adams. Um, when I was in a philosophy conference in Boston, they did a special session as kind of in honor of Marilyn because she had passed that earlier that year. And so a lot of philosophers were there who had studied under Marilyn and were reading papers uh, in her honor. And Robert Adams was there and I got a chance to meet him and tell him how um, helpful his work has been in my own philosophy my own writing. Degrees, Princeton, Oxford, Cornell. He's taught many places, including Yale, Oxford, Rutgers. I think he ended at the University of North Carolina, if I remember right, quasi-retired. One of his most well-known books, Finite and Infinite Goods, considered by many, even those who disagree with them, the best contemporary theistic theory of objective morality. And when I built my theory of objective morality based on the Trinity, I used his theory as my model or as my base foundation that I built mine on top of. So he was helpful. You know, I'd email him back and forth and give me um, a little bit of direction. So it was, it was good meeting him in person finally in Boston that, that time. Another Robert, and I put him on here for several reasons. He's a world-famous philosopher, specifically in the fields of epistemology and moral intuitionism. You can just Google his name or look up his name in um, Google or Amazon, and you'll see all the books he's written, published by Oxford, Cambridge. Very, very well-known author and world-famous philosopher teaches now at uh, Notre Dame, which is the top philosophy of religion department in the world, most would say. But for many years, decades in fact, he was the chair of the philosophy department at our university here at the University of Nebraska. So when I was an undergrad in the business college and I took intro to philosophy just as an elective, he was my professor and I had no clue at the time that he was a pre-modern thinker or even a Christian. He's Presbyterian. Um, but I do, looking back on it 25 years later, I, I do remember in his class studying philosophical arguments for and against the existence of God. So that was, you know, even a part of his class at the time. Uh, in a secular school, obviously, he wasn't going to wear it on his sleeve what his position necessarily was, though many do. So I think sometimes that's appropriate, sometimes it's not. In this class, I find it to be appropriate because I'm teaching this as part of a Christian seminary. But if you're in a secular school, um, I think it's you have to be a little bit more careful about using it maybe as a platform just to promote your own ideas. I think it's appropriate in a secular setting to um, explain your positions and say what your positions are but 
usually in those environments you want to spend most of your time explaining the different positions because you're trying to educate students to know what the different positions are. doesn't mean professors can never take positions, obviously they do, but I think they err when they use their platform to only promote their own ideas. I think you just have to be careful about that. And even myself so, doing this through you know, a seminary Bible college. I don't want to use it merely to promote my ideas, but I've been clear about what I believe and, and what my positions are. So some of the books that he's written, uh, Rationality and Religious Commitment. Another book he's written titled Religion in the Public Square. So, you know, he's talking and writing about these things that we're discussing. Alvin Plantinga, of course, we've talked a lot about him. I showed you guys that video that summarized his life and work when he won the Templeton Prize. So if you'd like to watch that again, feel free. I'm not going to show it again, but it's easily find it. Just search Alvin Plantinga Templeton Prize, and you'll get that six-minute video to watch again. Very well done. But here's a quote from him. He says, uh, what I've always wanted to do as a philosopher is defend Christianity, defend a Christian way of thinking about things and argue that to be a Christian is not to be irrational or senseless or silly. So now we're going to cover a few philosophers that I didn't mention before. So these are a few new ones that I didn't cover when I did this resurgence of pre-modern thinking within analytic philosophy a couple weeks ago. So the next one is Peter, I think it's Kreft. I've heard some people say Kreft too, but I think it's Kreft. He's a professor of philosophy both at Boston College and King's College in New York. And uh, I want to read a, a quote. He's definitely a Thomistic philosopher, Thomas Aquinas. In fact, he has a great um, book about the Summa. Uh, Thomas Aquinas' major book, uh, The Summa Theologica, I believe. And, and Peter Kreft has a good book on that to help you understand it, break it down. So I'm going to read this quote from Peter Kreft. Of the 21 great civilizations that have existed on our planet, according to Toynbee's reckoning, ours, the modern West, modernism at least, is the first one that doesn't have or teach its citizens any answer to the question why they exist. A euphemistic way of saying this is that our society is plural, pluralistic and leaves us free to choose or create our own ultimate values. You know, that's the whole postmodern movement over 200 years. A more candid way of saying the same thing is that our society has nothing but its own ignorance to give us on this, the most important of all questions. And as society grows, it knows more and more about less and less. It knows more and more about the little things and less about the big things. Another Robert, something about being named Robert, I guess, in this resurgence. Robert Coons is a professor of philosophy at the University of Texas. We brought him here to the University of Nebraska to speak. Rasha Christie did, ministry organization that I work for brought him here to UNL to speak. Does God exist? Had uh, dozens, or I know, I think three or four hundred people showed up to that event. It was a good size event. Oh, and then I forgot to mention that we're bringing Robert Audie back to the University of Nebraska next year, next semester in the spring. We're bringing him back because he was a professor here bringing him from Notre Dame to come speak here. I've been emailing him back and forth, getting all the details worked out. But we brought Dr. Coons here from the University of Texas, and uh, he's a well-known philosopher. I wanted to point out one, one of his books. He was the co-editor with this other gentleman, George Beeler, of a book called The Waning of Materialism. This was published in 2010 by Oxford University Press. And what this book is, is a collection of articles by leading analytic philosophers who are critical of the idea that the only things that, that exist are physical things.
right? So they're critiquing materialism. They're critiquing uh, naturalism, physicalism. You know, all that exists is the physical universe. And all these analytic philosophers have written articles and then they collected it in this, this book that he put together. All right, number nine. Uh, this one's going to be a little, it's going to take a little bit of explanation because um, some people might very much question my, my choice of him here. So this is Jürgen Habermas, and um, a couple reasons I included him on the list here. It might confuse people because a lot of times he's associated with whew, critical theory, postmodernism, the Frankfurt School, Marxism, and so a lot of people would, would be very confused why I'm including him on this list. But I'll try to explain. Um, give, me, give me a few minutes here to explain my choice. Let me start out by saying that philosophers in Germany have been some of the strongest forceful critics of postmodernism. Um, Jürgen Habermas is a German philosopher. But German philosophers as a group, or there's been a lot of German philosophers that have really pushed back against postmodernism, one of them being um, Habermas. Now, a lot of these philosophers in Germany that are critiquing postmodernism, some of them are advocating to go back to more modern ideas, Enlightenment ideas. Some of them like I, are promoting more pre-modern ideas. Some do a combination of the two, right? There's not a, sometimes there's not a strict firm line. Some of these things kind of grow, snowball. You can pick and choose a little bit. I've tried in this class to make things, you know, more fine line just for the sake of learning the material. But as you know, you know, different ideas can be combined. So Habermas, probably is the most influential philosopher, not just pre-modern philosopher or, you know, certain type of philosopher, but just most influential philosopher, period, in Germany over the last 50 years. Global polls often put him as one of the most widely recognized leading intellectuals in the world. So, I want to tell you a little bit about his thoughts, his beliefs, what he teaches. He says that the Enlightenment is an unfinished project. He's a fan of the Enlightenment and he wants us to go back to it. It's unfinished, it needs to be corrected, needs to be complemented, but it shouldn't be discarded, according to Habermas. So he probably is going to lean a little bit more modern than he is pre-modern. However, I'm going to show you some quotes from him that are rather interesting. So in the sense that he is advocating for Enlightenment ideas, uh, modernism ideas, in that he distanced himself from the Frankfurt School. Uh, in that he distanced him, where that's his background is the Frankfurt School, neo-Marxism. Neo but he kind of distanced himself from it and from postmodernism when he advocates for Enlightenment ideas. He actually criticizes the Frankfurt School, neo-Marxism that he came from, and criticizes postmodernism for sure for its excessive pessimism, its radicalism, and its over-exaggerations. He had a long, long-standing, like decades-long dispute back and forth with Derrida one of the key postmodern philosophers. So he's a critic of uh, postmodernism. And one of the reasons I wanted to put him on this list is I teach this class in Germany, and um, I spend about a month every year living and teaching in Germany, and so I wanted to include a German philosopher on the list as well. But here's the things that encourage me about his um, philosophy, especially his, his later philosophy, later in his life. He said that Romanticism and Nietzsche got us off track 
by encouraging us to follow the non-rational aspects of our thinking. So just like me, he's very critical of Romanticism and Nietzsche's work. And he, as a German philosopher, argues that the problems in Germany that led to World War II arose because those movements, Nietzsche, Romanticism, what I've been calling postmodernism in this class, those movements or those um, philosophies moved Germany away from the Enlightenment ideals, the Enlightenment way of thinking, the ideals of reason and public rational debate, and that's what caused the problems in Germany which led to World War II, according to Habermas. So he's big on uh, public rationality. He argues against the postmodernists by arguing that language can express universal truths, which can be discussed in the public sphere. And he argues for public discourse and rational argument, which is very not postmodern, right? So you can see how he's a critic uh, of postmodernism, probably coming more from a modern not a Christian as far as I understand, but coming more from a modern uh, perspective. At the beginning of his philosophical, philosophical career, he was very skeptical of religion being even useful in society. So that would reflect his neo-Marxism, his background in the Frankfurt School, you know, having that Marxist idea that religion is just a waste of time and even more so like an opium for the people just to keep the the people quiet and subdued so very much against religion in his early career however I want to um, show you and it's on the handout I want to show you what somebody has written about Habermas but then a quote more importantly a quote from Habermas himself where he's kind of changed on this on his on his view of religion. I don't think he's a religious man himself. I don't think he's a Christian. But you'll see now in his later philosophy that he's got a different take on the usefulness of religion, especially as compared to postmodernism. So here's a quote about him first. It says, Habermas has popularized the concept of a post-secular society to refer to current times in which the idea of modernity is perceived as unsuccessful and at times morally failed, so that rather than a stratification or separation, a new peaceful dialogue and coexistence between faith and reason must be sought out in order to learn mutually. So here you go, faith and reason working together. And you're going to see in this quote from him, it's a long quote, but it's good, I think it's worth reading, He's going to talk about uh, modernity as well as um, pre-modernity. So again, think about what I've been describing this semester, pre-modernism, modernism, and post-modernism. And he's going to talk about all three. And if, if, even if he doesn't use those exact words, he's going to talk about those three movements. So look at this. This is the quote from him now. For the normative self-understanding of modernity, modern era, Christianity has functioned, he, he's using Christianity to talk about pre-modern thinking, which Christianity is part of, of course. Christianity has functioned as more than just a precursor or a catalyst. So obviously it came before in time, chronologically, but it was more than that. Universal, universalistic egalitarianism, from which sprang the ideals, the Enlightenment ideals of freedom, and a collective life in solidarity, the autonomous conduct of life and emancipation, the individual morality of conscious human rights and democracy, all those Enlightenment ideas are the direct legacy of the Judaic ethic of justice and the Christian ethic of love. So he's saying all these Enlightenment ideas came from pre-modern thinking. This legacy then, substantially unchanged, has been the object of a continual critical reappropriation and reinterpretation. You know, these ideas have changed and morphed, obviously, but that's where they came from. Up to this very day, there is no alternative to it. 
and in light of the current challenges of a post-national constellation, we must draw sustenance now, as in the past, from this substance, from this pre-modern philosophy, from Christianity, because everything else is idle, post-modern talk. So even though he's more of a modern thinker, he is very much critiquing postmodernism, but also recognizing in his modern Enlightenment ideals, Christianity or premodernism had a large part to play in where his modern Enlightenment ideas came from and says that they're useful. So my point here with this quote is to say that he is no longer against religion, but now understands later in his life the importance of these things. And I think it opens up the door, even though he's not a Christian or a religious man himself, it opens up the door for us as Christian philosophers, if you will, to speak, to come to the table and engage in this conversation with ideas um, when he and people like him say these things. Well, the last one we're going to look at and actually spend the most time on is Michael Polanyi. All right, so we're going to spend the rest of the lecture taking a look at the number 10, Michael Polanyi. Now, um, he's not alive anymore. He passed away in the 70s. So, but he was, I guess you could say he was an early when it comes to this resurgence of pre-modernism, he was definitely an, an early precursor to that. So he, d he didn't see, you know, towards the end of his life, maybe the resurgence was beginning, but he was definitely an instigator of it. And just some background, some history, he was very influential in Francis Schaeffer's thinking. And Francis Schaeffer has been in very influential in my thinking. So I thought going through Polanyi's philosophy would be a good way to kind of summarize the entire class in a sense. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through uh, Polanyi's ideas, but you'll see in Polanyi's ideas a lot of what I've been saying all semester. So in that sense, we can use this as a way to summarize. So, he started his career as a world-famous physical chemist. So, he began, I think, in Germany in the 20s, 30s, uh, 40s, a, a world-famous scientist. But he turned to philosophy because he was frustrated with logical positivism. So he was within the scientific world, world-famous chemist, um, but logical positivism, ruling in the sciences, ruling in philosophy for the most part. He was very, and we've talked about logical positivism, that extreme form of modernism where all that we can believe are, is what science teaches us. As a scientist, he rejected that wholeheartedly. So, kind of ahead of his time in, 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 in terms of rejecting logical positivism. He rejected it much sooner than everybody else did. Pretty much everybody rejects it now. By the 70s, at least for sure by the 80s, it was completely dead. But he was one of the first, you know, big outspoken critics of logical positivism. And some would say, you know, had a, a part to play in its demise. So he made a huge contribution in uh, epistemology called critical realism. So if you want to learn uh, more about uh, a movement really that he, he was a big part of and maybe even the instigator of, it's called critical realism. Now that term is used for a couple different things. So if you Google that, you know, you might find a couple different um, uh, movements that go by that name. But if you can find the movement called critical realism that's associated with Michael Polanyi, then you'll know you've got the right critical realism. So one of the things he taught is that, I believed and, and, and promoted in his philosophy, 
is that all of our beliefs have an element of faith or an element of trust because we can't know things with absolute certainty. I'm sure that sounds familiar. His most famous book is a book called Personal Knowledge. I think a post-critical assessment. So critical being modernism, critical method, Descartes, post-critical. So after modernism. So he's reacting against modernism, but not postmodern in the sense that I've uh, explained here. So yes, he said, uh, modernism's attempt to know things with absolute certainty has failed. However, that doesn't mean that we can't know anything. That would be going too far to the other extreme. Okay. So he's rejecting, rejecting the absolute certainty of modernism, but not going with the overreaction to that, which is the postmodern idea that therefore, if we can't know with absolute certainty, then we can't know anything at all. He kind of um, edged out a middle ground position very much <laughs> uh, like pre-modern, like the pre-modern position. So the position that he developed is, has a lot of similarities, and he even admits that. His position, his middle ground position between these two extremes, modernism and postmodernism, is very pre-modern. And he even says that, which we'll see. Now, um, it's interesting to look into his religious beliefs. And we don't know, and when I say we, I mean everybody, <laughs> We, none of us know for sure what his religious beliefs really were. It's hard to tell, and I've done quite a bit of research, and I've talked to people, and I've read a lot, and other people who have done more research than me have come to the same conclusion, that they don't know um, if he was a Christian or not, if he really believed that there was an, a literal, objective God out there or not. It's just hard. He wasn't very open about those sort of things. So might have been a Christian, possibly not. We don't know. He did go to church his whole life, but obviously it doesn't mean he believed that there really was a uh, supreme ultimate being, a God. When he would get asked that directly, he would, he would often dodge the question. So it's hard to say. Some people want to argue for sure that he really was a Christian, Some you know that his atheist fans... I want to argue that he wasn't, but honestly, we just don't know. Regardless, um, I'm a huge fan of his philosophy. Francis Schaeffer was a huge fan of his philosophy, especially his epistemology, and I think you'll see why. And, and because a lot of the things I've been saying all semester um, line up with what he held to as well. In fact, as we, as we go through this, it might be useful for you to have out my six stages, the way that I organize the class and organize the history of Western philosophy. It might be good, as we do this final review of this, to have this out as I'm going through Polanyi's philosophy. You can see how my thoughts line up with his. Okay. So, uh, Polanyi, he said that the root of the problem began, philosophy, epistemology, all the stuff we're talking about, the root of the problem began in the early modern era. And one of the people he pinpointed was William of Ockham. We didn't talk about Ockham in this class, but you're probably familiar with the name, Ockham's Razor. Um, but William of, of Ockham was a Christian theologian, philosopher, in the early modern era, and uh, 12th, uh, 13th century, and Polanyi traced a lot of the philosophical problems of modernism and postmodernism back to Occam. So here's a quote from Polanyi. Occam brought scholasticism, remember we talked about Aristotelian scholasticism, Thomas Aquinas, so on and so forth. Occam brought scholasticism to a close by declaring that faith and reason were incompatible and should be kept strictly separate. 
Thus, he ushered in the period of modern rationalism, which too accepts this separation, but which with the new proviso that reason alone can establish true knowledge. So, he's blaming, he's putting a lot of the blame on this guy, William of Ockham. He had a part to play in it, obviously not the sole person to blame, but his philosophy, just like a lot of philosophers we've looked at in this class, had a huge influence on others. So, Descartes, <clears throat> I'm just speaking, telling you Polanyi's thinking, Polanyi's thought here. Polanyi said that Descartes attempted to exclude faith altogether. Now, Descartes didn't reject the certainty of divine revelation, but he attempted to build an alternate path to absolute certainty using reason alone. And this led to, eventually, a, a devaluation of divine revelation. Over time, this approach eroded our confidence in our ability to know anything except what could be known through human reason, and specifically uh, science, which science is just a, a specific application of our reason, right? So eventually this led to the idea that something shouldn't be believed unless it could be tested empirically with experience. If something couldn't be tested with experience, then you should automatically doubt it and conclude most likely it was meaningless. And that extreme came in the form of logical positivism, of course. Polanyi argued that limiting knowledge to this way cut people off from believing in justice, beauty, morality, love, meaning, all those things that we could believe in before, now we can't because of this extreme, what I called scientism. We can only believe things that science can prove. So you can't really study justice scientifically, you can't study beauty, morality, love, meaning, purpose in life. None of that can be studied scientifically, so chalk it all up to meaningless. doesn't exist. No such thing as morality. Justice, beauty, love, meaning. So restricting our knowledge to just scientific knowledge led to us viewing the world as this vast, impersonal machine, according to Polanyi. Here's another quote from him. He said, eventually it was to appear that the primary qualities of such a universe, this mechanical universe as we viewed it, could be brought under intellectual control by applying Newtonian mechanics to the motions of matter, while its secondary qualities could be derived from this underlying primary reality. And thus emerged, out of modernism, the mechanic, mechanistic conception of the world, viewing the world, the universe, as just this big, vast machine. And then later, eventually, we began to think that even humans themselves were merely cogs in the machine. That we, human beings, were machines ourselves, produced by this impersonal mechanical process, evolution. And Polanyi argued that when humans are reduced to merely the mechanics of physics and chemistry, then the person as well as all personal significance, disappears. And this is what he saw happening, happened in modernism. Another quote from Polanyi, he wrote, You can destroy meaning, purpose, meaning of life, you can destroy it wholesale by reducing everything to its uninterpreted particulars. We can eliminate all subsidiary awareness of things in terms of others and create an atomized, totally depersonalized universe. And that's what modernism led to. Remember, that was one of the dead ends of modernism as I explained it. Because this leaves people then with no reasonable explanation for meaning, morality, love, beauty, justice. But one of the things that Polanyi saw was that people still tried to, inconsistently, they still tried to hold on to all those things. And as I have explained, the only reason, the only way that they could hold on to those things is to take a leap of faith and believe in love, 
we have this mechanical view of things. Modernism said that there is no love, just chemical reaction, so on and so forth, that we still want to hold on to love and morality and justice and beauty and meaning, and so we do it with the leap of faith. Anne Hathaway's character in Interstellar in that five-minute clip, perfect example. We don't have any explanation for love, but we're just going to believe it anyway. And he pointed out this inconsistency, and here's a quote where he talks about it. He says, wherever the current scientific outlook bears directly on man and society and affects our worldview, it denatures its subject. Only the blessed inconsistency, this is what I'm calling the rational inconsistency of the leap of faith, it's an irrational, it's inconsistent with rationality, with the science, with the mechanic worldview, we just take an inconsistent with that leap of faith to believe in love. This blessed inconsistency of its expositors prevents them from rendering man and all the sufferings and works of man quite meaningless. So you got this tension. You got this, okay, science says that there is no meaning and purpose. Love's just a chemical reaction. There's no such thing as beauty, justice, meaning, morality. But on the other hand, we're going to take a leap of faith and irrationally believe in those things anyway. And he says that's inconsistent, and it, but there's this tension where we want to have both things. And he described this inconsistency when it came to morality, in particular, as a moral inversion. Now he goes into a lot of history here that I'm not going to delve into, but let me just summarize some of, this, some of his conclusions here. This moral inversion, this believing in morality when you don't really have any justification for doing so, you just take a blind leap and believe in morality, um, this blessed inconsistency, he makes this uh, long argument, and I think does it well, that this moral inversion, this moral inconsistency, forms the cement between the optimistic utopian ideals and the crushing totalitarian control of fascism and communism. So he's like, like Habermas, he's laying a lot of the blame of World War II, communism, fascism, on um, these postmodern ideas of inconsistency, trying to believe in love and morality and meaning and purpose when, when science, when we're, on the other hand, when we're saying on the other hand that science is the only way to know truth and science says none of those things exist. So believing in all those things with a leap of faith when our science tells us they don't exist and science is the only way to know truth, is this blessed inconsistency. And that is a big part of what led to the horror of World War II, according to Polanyi. I'll let him say it himself. Try to explain it himself here with this quote. And then we'll move on because it's, it's a very, it can be pretty detailed to go through his argument here. But I think you can pick it up just from this quote. I tried to summarize it just with one quote. He wrote, The moment, however, a community ceases to be dedicated through its members to transcendent ideals, you know that there really are transcendent truths like love and morality, what I've been calling ultimate truths in this class. When a community ceases to be dedicated to transcendent ideals, it can continue to exist undis undisrupted, only by submission to a single center of unlimited secular power. In a sense, he's saying what I said earlier, that when you, know, you take these ideals or these universal truths or God, if you will, out of the picture, something has to fill that power vacuum. And according to Polanyi and others, what filled that power vacuum was the state or group, putting the, the group ahead of the individual fascism or communism. Nor can citizens who have radically abandoned belief in spiritual realities, these transcendent truths, on the obligations to which their conscience would have been entitled and in duty bound to take a stand, neither can they raise any valid objection to being totally directed by the state. So they don't really have anything to appeal to to um, knock down the state when it tries to take power and control. 
both in communism and in fascism. In fact, their love of truth and justice turned them automatically into love of state power. So in other words, what he's saying here is that when people are seen as machines, when you just view human beings as machines, you know, remember we said machines don't have free will, they're just programmed. In the case of human beings, they're programmed through evolution, their DNA, you know, they don't make free choices, they're not, they can't, they're not responsible. They're just programmed to do what they do through evolution, through their DNA. And when they're programmed like that, they're determined by nature, authoritarian states, both communistic and fascist states, use this to justify their manipulation and control of people. Uh, people aren't free, people can't, you know, they're not responsible. We've got to swoop in and take control of these automatons, really, these machines. So you're, you're, what you're doing is you're devaluing, you're depersonalizing human beings, and that justifies your right to go in and control them, because really all they are are machines anyway, right? So here's another quote from Polanyi. This is the cause of our corruption of the conception of man, reducing him to either an insentient automaton or to just a bundle of appetites their desires programmed by evolution. This is why science denies us the possibility of acknowledging personal responsibility. This is why science can be so easily invoked in support of totalitarian violence. Why science has become the greatest source of dangerous fallacies today. Now remember, he was a world famous science scientist before he moved into philosophy. So he knows uh, science. You can't accuse him of somebody who's who's Ill illiterate when it comes to, you know, the sci science itself and the scientific community. And he's not saying that the problem is science itself. He's a scientist. He loves science. The problem is the thinking that science is the only thing that can give us knowledge, that the only knowledge we can have is scientific knowledge. That's the problem. And that's what he was critiquing. He wasn't critiquing science itself, but the idea that science is the only way to get us true knowledge. So he wrote a lot and explained that science, scientists don't really work like people think they do. That science isn't this completely objective um, approach to knowledge. He claimed, as, even as a scientist himself, that it was impossible to be completely objective or to have purely objective knowledge. He said, no, that's not how scientists work. That's not how I work. That's not how other scientists work. Scientists are very personally and passionately involved in their work. And they often rely on intuition, imagination, and sometimes just simple hunches. So because of his frustration with this, he explained, this is the top quote, he explained the uh, thesis of his major work, that book, Personal Knowledge. He said, the purpose of this book is to show that complete objectivity, people, you know, especially in logical positivism, thought scientific knowledge was this complete objective knowledge, objective way of knowing things, as usually attributed to the exact sci sciences, is a delusion as an, and is in fact a false ideal. So he's just saying, you know, this idea of being able to achieve perfect objective knowledge, absolute certainty, is a delusion. That, that, that cannot be achieved, even in science. So he, these, these were fighting words, obviously, during his time with the logical positivists, which is logical positivism reigned in philosophy and in science during his life. So... Um, these were fighting words with, with that movement. And look at the second quote from him then. He said, It's true that science professes to be based on detached observation, but actually no knowledge of the external world can be discovered or held to be true in accordance with this ideal of strict detachment. I propose, therefore, a new theory of knowledge which recognizes the participation of the knower, 
as an indispensable coefficient of all knowledge, hence his title, Personal Knowledge. That's his theory, and that's the title of his book, Personal Knowledge. Now, he also criticized the opposite, okay? So we've talked about his view of modernism, his view of logical positivism, that that failed when it tried to know truth exhaustively. But he also recognized that when that failed, a lot of people moved their hope to this other path, uh, that some people gave up and they erred too far the other direction and concluded we can't know anything at all. And that's the extreme form of postmodernism. And he critiqued that as well. He said, just because we can't know things with absolute certainty doesn't mean that we can't know truth real, really. Since we're finite, we shouldn't expect to know things exhaustively. But his point was that those aren't the only two options. The only two, it's not that we just have either we know with absolute certainty or we don't know anything at all. He tried to stake out a middle ground where we reject both of those extremes and we can know things truly, just not with absolute certainty. So he did place a lot of emphasis on the subjective aspect of knowing. He thought there was a lot to be affirmed there. But don't misread that or don't misunderstand him. He's not promoting subjectivism. He's just acknowledging that whenever something is believed, it's a subject who's doing the believing. Uh, it's a person. So there is a subjective side to knowing, but that doesn't necessarily result in subjectivism or that all truth is, is relative, that extreme postmodern view. So he's a, acknowledging some aspects there, but still rejecting that extreme version of it. He believed in an external reality, an objective truth that's out there that we can make contact with, and he explained this in uh, this quote from Personal Knowledge. This is an important quote because he, he's defining his title for the book here. So take a look at this quote. Such is the personal participation of the knower in all acts of understanding. But this doesn't make our understanding subjective. This is where he has to clarify so people don't misunderstand him. He's not promoting postmodernism, subjectivism. Comprehension is neither an arbitrary act nor a passive experience, but a responsible act claiming universal val validity. So when we make claims or when we make claims about reality, we're claiming things about objective truth. Now, we can be right or wrong, but our beliefs are claims of universal validity. Such knowing is indeed objective in the sense of establishing contact with a hidden reality. Um, the, the word hidden there is confusing. We're just talking about an external reality. Sometimes it's hidden from us because it's hard to know sometimes. He's not saying we can always know external reality correctly, but we do make contact with that external reality. A contact that is defined as the condition for anticipating an indeterminate range of yet unknown and sometimes inconceivable true implications. We're not always saying that we can get to objective truth or external reality. Sometimes, since we're finite, we, we can't know what's really true. Um, what's on the other side of Pluto? You know, if before, before we had our modern scientific equipment, we could never know what was on the other side of Pluto, right? Because that was just a limitation to our knowledge. Sometimes we can't know things. Even though there is a truth to what's on the other side of Pluto, we can't access that truth um, at the time, you know, before we had our scientific equipment. So it seems reasonable, the last sentence here, it seems reasonable to describe this fusion of the personal, the subjective aspect of knowing, and the objective aspect of it as personal knowledge. And that's why he titled his book that. One example that he uses, and I think is really, really helpful, is language. He says, knowledge is 
kind of works like language works. So just think about language for a second, and this might cause you to remember some things from uh, the postmodern philosophers, Derrida in particular. So Polanyi said it's true that no two people are going to mean exactly the same thing when they use the same word. Okay. So that is a problem of language because we all have different backgrounds, we all have different experiences, we all have you know, different thoughts going through our mind when we use terms. So no two people are going to mean the exact same thing when they use the same word. However, there's enough overlap in their meaning that true communication can take place. True communication about external reality. This is you know, one of the things that Derrida said was impossible. That our language, our words, there's nothing outside the text. Remember Derrida said that? What he meant by that is that our language, our communication, our words can never uh, with each other get at external reality because they're just stuck within words, within meanings, and there's no connection between our words, our language, with external reality. And Polanyi is saying, no, that's not the case. Real communication about external reality does take place, even though it's difficult, and oftentimes, you know, we misinterpret one another. But because there's enough overlap in our respective meanings of words, real communication about external reality does take place. Doesn't mean it's always easy, doesn't mean we're always successful, but we can achieve true communication about external reality in spite of these difficulties. And he says knowledge is, is the same way. Everyone does see reality a bit differently. He affirms that. So there is a subjective element in knowing things. I often refer to that just being our finite or being finite ourselves. But be, just because that our knowledge has some subjective aspects to it doesn't mean we are completely unable to know external reality. Okay, another big point of his philosophy is, this is all the language stuff I went through. I forgot to move on to the next screen. Another big part of his philosophy was it's, it sounds to a lot of people at first like he's criticizing science, and he's not. He's a professional scientist himself. He loves science. He thinks science is a great way to get knowledge. What he's criticizing is the idea that science is the only way for us to get knowledge. And so part of his critique is to explain that the way we get scientific knowledge really isn't that much different than the other ways that we get information or the other ways that we get knowledge. And his point here in, in showing how much subjectiveness goes into getting our scientific knowledge wasn't trying to criticize scientific knowledge, but to show that our scientific knowledge isn't unique or altogether different from our other types of knowledge. And so what he's doing here is not bringing scientific knowledge down. Well, he is in a sense because logical positivism brought it up too high. But really what he's doing is he's bringing up the other types of knowledge. He's redeeming the other ways of knowing things that logical positivism had pretty much said were uh, impossible to know things through. So he's redeeming things like intuition, aesthetic knowledge, knowledge of beauty, imagination, morality, even religious knowledge. He's redeeming those things by showing that all of those ways of getting knowledge really are very similar to how scientists get scientific knowledge. So instead of, if you think of the logical positivists as saying, you know, scientific knowledge is this great, only, the only good way of getting knowledge and all these other ways are really bad, and the logical positivist said these are very two different ways of knowing things. Polanyi is saying, actually, no, they're not very different at all, and they should all be more on a level playing field in terms of that's, that's how they work um, in practice, 
they, they work very similar. We get scientific knowledge very similar to the way we get these other knowledges. And so that shouldn't, scientific knowledge shouldn't be put on the um, pedestal that it's often put on. And this included, as I said, uh, religious knowledge. Now it's unclear, you know, what his exact religious beliefs were, but we do know for sure that he um, advocated for uh, religious knowledge working the same way as scientific knowledge. In other words, it should be verified with evidence. So remember, this goes back to, you know, especially when I was critiquing Immanuel Kant. And I was saying how Kant divided up different types of knowledge. Well, you can have, you know, scientific knowledge. We can know that with absolute certainty. But then these other types of knowledge is God, free will, morality. We've got to just believe those with the leap of faith, in a sense. So there's different ways of knowledge, different um, types of knowledge, different ways we know things. Reason can't know about these type of things at all. And where I said, no, all of our knowledge works the same way. None of it we can know with absolute certainty. All of it, is, it has an element of faith or trust in it. So Polanyi is saying the same thing, that all of our types of knowledge works the same way and should be validated by evidence. Just like science, our scientific beliefs should be validated by evidence, Polanyi said our religious beliefs should either be verified or sometimes uh, refuted by evidence. Our religious beliefs should be based on good reasons and evidence, in a nutshell. So he rejected the idea that science and religion were trying to describe completely different domains. He rejected the idea that religious knowledge is just a mystical leap of faith, different from other types of knowledge somehow immune from verification. And he wrote, even though, even if he wasn't a religious or had religious beliefs himself, he wrote that he hoped his work would lead us back to the conception of religious worship as a heuristic vision and align religion in turn also with the great intellectual systems like mathematics, fiction, the fine arts, which are validated by becoming happy dwelling places of the human mind. We shall see then that in spite of its acritical character, the force of religious conviction does depend on factual evidence and can be affected by doubt concerning certain facts. Now to me this is huge because what he's saying here is that faith and reason should work together. We should only have religious beliefs if they're based on good reasons and evidence. Facts are important. This is radically different, remember, than continental philosophy, radically different than the postmodern idea that our religious beliefs are just these leaps of faith that we take, these irrational things we believe in, as long as they give us purpose and meaning in our life. You know, the whole Kierkegaardian existential way of believing in religious things. Not based on reasons and evidence, but just a leap of faith in your heart because they help you feel better about life. He said, no, our religious beliefs should be based on facts, based on reason and evidence. So you hear me say that all the time, so it just seems like a no-brainer, but I'm trying to help you realize how radical this would be compared to everything else during his time that believed, most believed, that religious beliefs were just these leap of faith things, even the religious people themselves, including most Christians. He had a great respect for Augustine, and this is where I talked about he himself, in his own words, aligned himself with famous pre-modern thinkers. So he was a huge fan of Augustine, in particular Augustine's balance of faith and reason, he said of Augustine that Augustine's work ended the extreme Greek rationalism just like he hoped his work would help curtail the extreme modern rationalism. 
One of the things he would say a lot is all beliefs are fiduciary. Fiduciary, what does that mean? Um, basically, all our beliefs involve commitment and risk. So, they're, like I say, there's an element of faith and trust in all of our beliefs and commitments, our religious and our scientific commitments. So here's, here's a way that I often summarize it. You've heard me do this before, but, and Polanyi doesn't do it himself. This is more from me and Schaefer, I believe. But I think the decision to marry somebody is a prime example of this, right? So all of our, and so you use this as an example, and then you just say that all of our beliefs work this way. But think about marrying somebody. You shouldn't trust someone to marry them until you at least have some basic knowledge about that person, even if that knowledge is just that your parents chose that person in an arranged marriage. On the other hand, it's impossible to learn everything there is to know about somebody before you marry them, so there's a middle ground there. It's not like you don't know anything about them. It's not blind faith, but it's also not absolute knowledge. You can't know everything about somebody before you marry them. So there's always an element of faith, always an element of trust and risk in that marriage choice. And what I'm saying, and I think what Polanyi is saying, is that all of our beliefs work like that. All of our beliefs and commitments have an element, at least some element, of risk and faith and trust because we can't know things with absolute certainty. Now, i got a couple things left I want to do. We've got about 15 minutes left tonight. And a couple more things I want to do now that we're done talking about Polanyi. Earlier in the lecture, I said that there are some, as part of this resurgence of pre-modernism, there are actually some atheists that are part of this. So, in other words, there's been a pre-modern resurgence among atheists as well. And you might think, well, how could, how could an atheist be considered pre-modern? And I'll, I'll, I'll explain how. They're Platonic. They're not Christians, but as I, as I keep saying, pre-modernism includes more than Christianity. Pre-modernism includes Christianity and, you know, a lot of Greek philosophy, Greek philosophers. So, for example, Aristotelianism is making a big comeback. There's a lot of atheists who are Aristotelians nowadays. And also Platonism, atheistic Platonism is making a big comeback. And these would both be considered pre-modern um, in the sense that they align with big pre-modern thinkers like Plato and Aristotle. Now, Plato and Aristotle were both theists, and these guys that I'm going to be talking about now are atheists, so they reject that aspect of pre-modernism, but they accept a lot of either Aristotle's thought or Plato's thought. And what's interesting, especially about the um, Platonic atheist philosophers, is one of the things that makes them Platonic is they reject materialism, uh, physicalism, naturalism, whatever you want to call it. They reject the idea that the only thing that exists is the physical material universe because they're Platonists. They believe that there are these universal truths, maybe call them abstract objects, transcendent truths, whatever you want to call them, outside the physical material universe. So they're, they're atheists because they don't believe that there is a God outside the universe, but they're not naturalists. Uh, they believe that there are things outside the universe, in particular these Platonic truths. So we've talked about Platonic's, or we've talked about Plato's theory way back at the beginning of the class. I'm assuming that you remember that and understand Plato's theory. So these guys would be affirming uh, Plato's abstract objects, universal truths out there. So two of them, just quickly I'll tell you about. One of them is Eric Wielenberg. He argues that moral truth is real and objective. 
And he often describes these moral truths he believes in as platonic abstract objects. Thus he believes there are things that exist beyond the physical universe. David Enoch is another one. He has a similar platonic position as Wielenberg. Interesting, he wrote that his form of moral realism was a ridiculed minority in 2003. But by 2011, it had made an impressive comeback and has been noted by some now as the dominant view. Just again, you know, more evidence from Enoch here that pre-modernism is making a big comeback, even in atheism. And my major, just as a footnote here, my uh, major work in philosophy is to critique these guys. So my dissertation is I'm critiquing and arguing against uh, Wielenberg. I had a debate with him at the University of Nebraska. I wrote a book with him, um, gotten to know him personally. I consider him a, a friend. But my major work is to argue with him. I mean, we both agree that there is objective moral truth, so I don't argue with him about that. The difference between him and I is that I think I argue that Christianity, in particular, you know, the Trinity is the best explanation for objective morality, whereas he proposes his um, Platonic theory. He, called, he calls it uh, godless normative realism. He argues that his um, atheistic Platonism is the best explanation for objective morality. So I critique that. I argue that his explanation is not plausible, and my explanation that morality is based on the Trinity is, is a better explanation for objective morality. But we're both pre-modern in the sense that we both agree that there is such a thing as objective, um, real moral truth that exists outside the universe, outside of our own minds. Okay, the last thing we're going to cover, <laughs> got a lot to cover tonight. But I think you'll enjoy this part of it. Um, one thing that I've been saying all semester is that though a lot of these ideas start in philosophy, major thinkers, philosophers, they trickle down to the culture, to the masses through art. Not many people read the philosophers themselves, but artists, some artists do, and they pick up on the ideas from the philosophers, and then they incorporate and teach those ideas in and through their art. Not only paintings, but music, movies, TV, songs, uh, comic books, all forms of art then teach these philosophical ideas that philosophers develop. And we looked at several examples of those different forms of art through the semester. So the question we could pose is, if pre-modern philosophy is making a comeback, if it has made a comeback, at least to some degree over the last 30 or 40 years, have we seen it impact the art world? In other words, have we seen a resurgence or has this resurgence of pre-modern thinking affected the art world? Are we seeing pre-modern um, forms of art make a comeback? And I think, in fact, we are. And that's what I want to point out to you tonight as we close. <coughs> now, to do this, I have uh, the last handout for you, if you want to grab that. And this came to you in the form of a spreadsheet, but I think this spreadsheet is going to be really helpful for you. Um, to do your final exam, which is a take home, open note, open book, this handout will be helpful for you in that, I believe. Um, and it will also be helpful as you write your final paper, that historical survey. So not only will it be helpful just tonight in this lecture, but this can be a resource for you for your final assignments and just to have for the future. So um, 
If you start on the first tab of the spreadsheet, it simply is what we've already covered. So we got a history of philosophy here. I broke it down in pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. And this is just a summary of the major philosophers and philosophical movements. So you got history, philosophy, and then within that spreadsheet, if you print it out, it'll be on the back side. But if you're just looking at the spreadsheet, it'll be off to the right of the history of philosophy. Off to the right will be the history of art. And I tried to line up and highlight, you know, the major art movements and how they line up and were in fact impacted by the various philosophical movements. So all that stuff is what we covered on that lecture about art uh, a month or two ago. But this is just a good summary of it on the first tab of that spreadsheet. The second tab of the spreadsheet though is what I want to draw your attention to now. And that is this resurgence of pre-modernism. Okay. So in the second tab of the spreadsheet, the first part is about pre-modern philosophy making a comeback. I got a quote from that Time Magazine article. I talk about some of the big names, and then I give you a whole mo a, a bigger list of names. Uh, not all the details, but you can look up some of these guys if you're curious. Besides the 10 we talked about, here are a lot of other academic, professional, pre-modern, contemporary, pre-modern thinkers, philosophers that have terminal degrees from you know, the best universities in the world and or professors at some of the best universities of the world, as you can see. So here's just a quick summary of pre-modern philosophy making a comeback. But on the flip side in that tab is a corresponding resurgence in pre-modern art. And this is what I want to close the lecture with just in the last few minutes here is to point out to you that um, realism in art is making a comeback. And I think it's in, in correspondence, in reaction, really, or in congruence, if nothing else, with this resurgence in pre-modern philosophy. So if philosophy and art, if philosophy moves art, um, then as this resurgence in pre-modern philosophy has been taking place, it's helped fueling this resurgence in pre-modern art. So I want to draw your attention to some to the details about this rise in what I'm calling pre-modern art. That's kind of my term. You know, artists don't use that term. But in this class, I'm just using that term so you know what I mean by it. You know, moving away from crazy postmodern art. And realism in art is making a comeback. So in particular, then, what I want to uh, look at then is on that handout and those quotes. I just want to read those quotes with you, and then we'll be done. And one of the major art movements in this, then, this contemporary pre-modern art movement, is a movement called contemporary realism. So you're going to see that term come up in these quotes. And I gave the links to these quotes so you can read more about this art movement. So look at the first quote there on the handout. Contemporary realism is a style of painting which arose in the 60s and 70s. Isn't that interesting? That's right when pre-modern philosophy started making a comeback. The movement refers to figurative art created in a highly objective style. Contemporary realism encompasses post-1970 sculptors and painters whose discipline is representational, representational art, where the object is to portray the real. Next one from artcyclopedia.com. Contemporary realism is the realistic approach to representation which is widely practiced in this post-abstract era. Many contemporary realists began as abstract painters, having come through an educational system dominated by professors dismissive of representational painting. Contemporary realism, third quote now here from the art story, contemporary realism emerged in defiance to abstract art. 
The movement is a return to representations of life, of reality. Suddenly, reality has become cool again. And I'm claiming that a large part of that is because of this resurgence in pre-modern philosophy. So the last quote is rather long, but I'm going to read it all because I think it's so important and interesting. And this comes from uh, the Art Renewal Center, ARC. And this is the website which promotes uh, this contemporary realism movement. So I think this is very fascinating. And this is an example here of this um, contemporary realism type of art making a comeback. Now, as you probably know, um, what I call postmodern art of the 1900s, abstract, surrealism, all that stuff, even, even going back to the Impressionism, what I call postmodern art in the art world is called modern art. It's just terms, it's just jargon, different fields called things, different things. But if you're you know, thinking from my class, pre-modern, modern, post-modern post philosophy, um, and then you go into the, uh, an art community or the art world, and somebody says modern art, well, you're going to think that that's associated with modern philosophy. But two different fields use two different types of jargon. So no, in the art world, when they say modern art, um, what they mean by that is art in the postmodern era of philosophy, 1900s for the most part. So what I call postmodern art in the art world, they call modern art, just terms. You can, call them, you can call it penguin art or red art for that matter. The terms don't matter. It's more of the ideas behind the movement. Okay, so let's read this and we'll wrap up the class. So it starts out, you may be one of the millions disillusioned with, I insert post. <laughs> he says modern art because he's in, in the art world, but I insert, as you can see, post and all of it. So that's how I'm going to read it. You may be one of the millions disillusioned with postmodern art, which for more than a century has been the dominant way art has been taught. It may be evident to you that works of art have more to communicate if they portray the real world or use objects from the real world even when portraying fantasies and dreams. The success of postmodernism seems like a form of mass insanity, a nightmare from which we pray the art world will soon awake. In the 20th century, people who felt as we do found themselves attracted to fine art from having been to museums and fallen in love with art from the 15th to 19th centuries. You may have wanted to become an artist and were channeled into art courses taught in universities where you were told your instincts were all wrong. Such works had a place in their time, but postmodern works were far superior. They attempted to convince you at these universities that art which commemorated the destructions of some aspect of what used to be traditional realism, were the only worthwhile art. You were never told that these educators had never themselves learned the skills needed by artists during the prior centuries, and so were completely bereft of any of the experience, skills, or knowledge for which you had assumed your tuition would be paying. They made you believe they could draw and paint, but chose to abandon those skills due to some great epiphany. Sound still coming through, Will? A few of you searched out one of a handful of artists who still taught the methods of the old masters. There were seven of such teachers in 1980. By 2002, when the Art Renewal Center decided to add to their website a section of ARC-approved schools, the number of such schools grew to 14, with each having 5 to 15 students. We added a map of the world so it became easy to identify all the schools and find the nearest one to you. Within a few months, the number of students able to find these schools grew geometrically, and today, just 14 years later, must have been written in 2016, there are now over 100 schools teaching this style, training thousands of students. Let's look at the aesthetic foundation of fine art as it evolved during the 19th century and the what I call postmodernist juggernaut, which almost led to its complete suppression. 
Realism is a, get this, a universal language that enables communication with all people. Postmodern and abstract art is not a language. It's the opposite of language because it represents the destruction of the language of fine art and is therefore the absence of language. The absence of language means the loss of communication. It takes away from mankind our most important characteristic, the ability to communicate in great depth, detail, and sophistication. And in the case of fine art, the postmodern paradigm banished the only universal language that exists, realistic imagery. You can see its connection with pre-modern, contemporary pre-modern philosophy. With the techniques and skills required to achieve it, realist artists, external reality is, is really there, and we have access to it. Realist artists strive not to be engulfed by despairing the brevity of life or the certainty of death and loss. This, together with absence of meaning, is the central belief of existential nihilism. It's no wonder that existentialism, he's talking about philosophy now, would espouse postmodern art or that postmodern artists would associate their work with existentialism since the essence of fine art had always been to express things which people find meaningful. Again, saying that there really is meaning. Whether religious paintings of the Renaissance or the genre paintings of the 17th and 19th centuries, postmodern works with their indecipherable meanings alienate and agitate us. Often, postmodern works are praised for doing just that. Their stated goals are often just to shock or insult. So I do all that just to point out this neat resurgence in realist art, which is connected with this contemporary resurgence of pre-modern philosophy. I do want to thank uh, one of my friends, Jeremy Gooding, who's actually the best man in my wedding almost 25 years ago good friend of mine from high school, lives here in Lincoln, and he is part of this art movement. He's a professional uh, full-time artist, and he, uh, in fact, painted this particular piece of art, which he titled Winter Solace. So I don't know much about the art world, um, but I lean on him and others for this type of material. So I just wanted a shout out to Jeremy Gooding for helping me point me uh, to this resurgence in real, of realism in the art world. Okay, let's take a look at the syllabus real quick. Make sure we're all on the same page for this last week of class. Let's pull out the class schedule. Today's December 3rd. You guys had quite a bit of reading for tonight. A chapter in Schaefer's book, and then 12, 13, 14, 15, four chapters in the Christian philosophy. So those reading summaries are due tonight by midnight to Caleb. Reading summary for both of those books. I gave the long lecture tonight on critiquing postmodernism. Caleb, I believe, has already emailed you the final exam which you have a week to do. It's take home, open note, open book, just like last time. So fill that out and do that for him. Email it back to him by next Thursday, December 10th, by midnight. And also due that day is the historical survey paper. And the details for all of that is in the syllabus. We've talked about it before. If you have any questions, email Caleb. But that's also due December 10th. And then we'll be all done. Thank you. I want to thank you for taking this class, those of you who have taken it online. In the future, if you have any questions that come up uh, in this area of philosophy um, or apologetics, you know, let me know. I'd love to be a resource for you. And keep in mind that I'm going to be teaching um, apologetics next semester, spring 2021. I'm going to be teaching it under the title of Philosophy of Religion. And part of the reason we're doing that is then just like this class, the credit can be transferred to secular schools like the University of Nebraska and others. And I know people who have already done that because I've taught this class through this uh, venue before. So if you're interested, contact me for the details. I haven't got everything nailed down yet for the spring class and apologetics, philosophy of religion, but we're getting those 
nailed down, and if you email me, then I can put you on the list for it. Similar format, offered online, or if you want to come be here on person, in person on Thursday nights, either way, you can take it for credit.